God. Give a hand to our beautiful worship team. Thank you so much, worship team. That was amazing. God bless y'all. Thank you so much. And Praise the Lord, church. I thought the worship team had a song, but clap for them as they take their seats. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Church, there are some things we are going to fight on, and I'm not, and I'm not accepting to lose. Amen? This time I'm going to hold until we all get this right. You know where I'm going, amen? This time I'm not, I'm, we are going to fight for this one until we all agree that I'm not going to lose this battle, amen? And this is the battle of these chairs here, and then you come and feel all those precious places behind there, and then you leave these chairs here. That one we are going to fight until we all get it, amen? I'm not preaching today until these chairs are filled. Hallelujah. Hey, so if you're seated behind there, make your way come and <laughs> I know those ones are more comfortable, but these ones are better. These ones look nice. Ask David how he's feeling. <laughs> so today I'm gonna ask you again, take a step, come forward, let's all sit here. And when you come to church every Sunday, I want you to do the same. Please come. Thank you so much. Come, come. If you're behind, if you are the very, very, very last. Come, come closer. Enjoy these wonderful seats. Yes, fill them up and do that every Sunday. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, don't be at the very, very end. At least come closer here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that looks better. Yes. Uh -huh. Now, if you have wonderful, if you have young kids, uh, feel free to stay behind. We have uh, a room there for uh, young people to go in if you have a uh, a child, but the Nasser is also open. Thank you very much, Anne. Asante San. Clap for Anne. She has come closest. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, this one I'm not losing. I promise you, this one we are going to fight until we do it. I don't know why church members are hard people. Hallelujah. This one we are going to go on until if you're visiting us for the first time, this is not how we do church. Amen. <laughs> church is wonderful, it's a good place. Thank you for being here. I don't know how you heard about this place, but we are glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. Clap for them one, one more time. Is it only him? I saw someone else that is here for the first time. Yes, you're here for the first time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for being here. Praise the Lord, amen. Yes, thank you. We love visitors, and whenever you come here, we love, love, and want to say thank you so much for being here. Amen? <clears throat> so, every time you come to church on Sunday, just remember, I'm going to ask you to move forward, so don't even uh, sit back, and then our ushers will have probably, Moses, more training to sit people, uh, in, uh, in good, good places. Hallelujah. The giving part is what I wanted to share with you. Can you put that uh, giving uh, thing back up? The flyer uh, that shows you how to give. Yes. Most of you give with cash up at the end, but our cash up normally jams on Sunday. When uh, all of us and people online try to give at the same time, something happens and it doesn't give. It, how many of you have experienced that before? Yeah, a couple of you have. So on Sunday it happens. And we've been wondering, so the money goes away from your account, but then it doesn't come to our account. It stays in your uh, WhatsApp until you give it back home to Africa for a fundraiser for your shama or for your first <laughs> church, whatever. So we want you to move to the second one, text giving. Very good. You type the word UBC on a text message and you send it to 73256. It gives you back a link, you put in your name, you put in your information, and every time you want to give, it will always be there. All you just do is say, how many of you use your text giving before? One, two, very few of us. It's very, very automatic, and then it helps us also have your names and information. So most of you that want your statements at the end of the year, it's through text giving. Cash App doesn't do that. But the text giving helps the people in the finance be able to give you everything you've given throughout the year. I want to encourage you, please, 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 if you don't mind, take a minute, text the word UBC to that number. It will send you a link back. 
You put in your name and your card and your information. And every Sunday, every time you want to give, it will always work for you. Uh, better than cash up. So we've been wondering and people send us a message. You know, I've been giving every Sunday, but the money is still on my cash up. Because it does not come whenever all of us try. So please take care of that. Uh, do that. Number two, we want to encourage all of us to move to that uh, second way of giving. Hallelujah. Glad, excited to be here today. Uh, it's December. And if you came early, <laughs> service again starts at what time? 10. I tell your neighbor, service starts at 10. Let them know. I know. The worship team was singing some Christmas carols because December is what? Christmas is coming. All of us remember that Christmas is coming in December. So this month has five Sundays. Series and the God that was looking for us, I was sharing a like we're going to be talking about but there's word that all of us know, and that's the good news. How many of you have heard about the good news? The good news, the good news. We're going to be talking at five Sundays about the good news of Christmas today, Sunday number one. We'll talk about. Remember these ones. Today we're talking about the promise of the good news. Then Sunday number two, we'll talk about seeking the good news. December 15th, the third Sunday, we'll talk about celebrating the good news, the angels and Mary and the shepherds, how they celebrate the good news. Then December 20th, how did the word get out? And then we will be here for the No, 24th at night, we'll be singing hymns and carols and Christmas songs to usher us into the Christmas on December 25. So that night, we'll talk about the fulfillment of the promise. And then the last Sunday of this month, we'll be looking forward to the return of Jesus, the completion of the good news. Amen? So we are looking at the good news series. Today is the promise of the good news. How do we get this one here? Okay. I had a preacher say, uh, this uh, preacher was preaching, he said, you know, if our greatest need as human beings was information, God would have sent us uh, an educator. If our greatest need was information, God would have sent someone who's, who's a good teacher. If our greatest need was technology, if we needed a new technology, God would have sent us a scientist. Amen. If our greatest need was money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need was pleasure, uh, you know, God would have sent us an entertainer. But what did God send us? He sent us Jesus, a savior. And that means, therefore, our greatest need was not uh, information. Our greatest need was not entertainment. Our greatest need was not money. Our greatest need was not pleasure. But our greatest need was forgiveness. Amen. If God knew that, what do these people need? This is who I need to send them. If I'm sending them Jesus because their greatest need is uh, forgiveness. Let us look at the word good news. Let us examine this word. There's a word that you hear. If you hear pastors talk about the word evangelion. Evangelion is the Greek word. And that's where we get the word the gospel. And from the word the gospel, we get the word the good news. That word evangelion has two words in it. EU and then angelion. Most of you that know understand some Spanish you hear, most of our Spanish speaking churches call the, the word evangelio, evangelical. It comes from the word message. So EU says the good, then angelos, the messenger or the message or the word that is spread out. So from that word evangelion, we get the word good news. Now here, as Christians, we use the word the gospel, which literally means the same thing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the same as saying the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a whole message of salvation. What is this good news? What is this gospel? Most of us say the gospel is the message of salvation. Most of us say the gospel is the message of the coming of the kingdom of God. Most of us say the gospel is the message about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, the gospel or the good news is used to describe the proclamation of God's redemptive plan through Christ, offering forgiveness and eternal life to 
to all who believe. Let me read that one again. In the New Testament, we're about to read, the gospel or the good news is used to describe the proclamation of God's redemptive plan. Proclaiming God's redemptive plan through Christ. So it's a plan offering forgiveness and eternal life to all who believe. And the word I wanted to look at there is the word plan. How do we arrive at this plan? You mean there was a plan way back there when all this started? The gospel is the proclamation of God's redemptive plan. What is this plan? When did this start? How did this plan come about? If we begin in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 to 2, I'll give you a minute to open it in your Bible. Romans chapter 1 verse 1 to 2. If you open there really quick, I'll read uh, with all of us. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. It says, I am Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Gospel of God. Let me read this one. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, separated to the good news which he promised before through the prophets. Now remember our definition, the good news, God's redemptive plan, proclaiming his plan of salvation through Christ Jesus. Paul said this gospel was promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. There was a plan of the gospel. There was a plan of the good news. This plan was promised. When, how, and why? As we drive towards Christmas on December 25th, not exactly that Jesus was born on December the 25th, but we celebrate the good news that he was born. Now, was there a promise that this good news would come? Yes. The Gospel of Mark kicks off. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And then he quotes Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. As it is written by Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. He will be a voice of one calling in the wilderness. He says, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight his, straight his path. The prophet Isaiah gives us most of the promises about the coming Messiah. Most of us love Isaiah 9.6. For unto us a child is born. We read it on Christmas. We read it the day before Christmas. On his shoulders, he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Ever. So many. But as Isaiah is trying to form these prophecies, these prophecies are also promised before back. In Luke 24, when Jesus comes back to life, he's walking to a small village. See that this is Jesus Christ. Their hearts were burning. He begins to tell them something. And you know what the Bible says? And him, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This good news we are getting ready, this redemptive story, this plan to save mankind began somewhere. The prophets of old have been telling us about it, but do we notice, do we know how it goes? John gave us a glimpse. He says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, Nothing was made. So John tries to tell us, this thing began way back. Micah says, but you, O Bethlehem, little Bethlehem, the town of Ephrata, through you, though you are small among all the clans of Judah, out of you is going to come one who will rule over Israel. One whose origins are from old, from ancient times. 
There's about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. About 60 of them are talking about his coming. When did this plan begin? I think this plan began in Genesis chapter 3. There's so much debate whether this is true. Let's go to Genesis if you have your Bible. When did this promise? Again, today we're talking about the promise of the good news. Where did this promise of the good news start? I think it started in Genesis. Uh, if you go to chapter 3, uh, we'll go to verse 15, but we'll read some of it. In Genesis chapter 1, there's a creation. And in Genesis chapter 2, there's another creation. There's two creation accounts in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2 tell us about the creation. And Genesis chapter 3 tell us about the fall of man. So, if you're to divide the Bible according to me, it's not about all the New Testament. It's not about 27, 30. For me, the Bible is divided from Genesis chapter 2 backwards and from Genesis chapter 3 onwards till the very end. Actually, Revelation, the things in Revelation, some of them have not even happened. So you and me are still living from Genesis chapter 3 all the way until Christ comes back. And from Genesis chapter 2 backwards, life was different. I will divide the Bible in two ways. Genesis chapter 2, go backwards, life is different. And in Genesis chapter 3 onwards, life is different. Why and what happened? We all know man disobeyed God. And in chapter 3, God passes down some judgments. The results of the fall of man were shame, pain, terror. And man was alienated from God, separated from God. Because the Bible says they realized they were naked. This is the total opposite of Genesis chapter 2 going backwards. Genesis chapter 2 going backwards, there was communion with God. Adam and Eve had conversations with God. Do you know they even had visitations? God would come to check on you. Can you imagine? <laughs> Life from Genesis chapter 2 back was different. You know, it says he had actually come to look for them. If you see Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. And they had the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees and again, God called them out. Guys, where are you? Three things. Communion with God. They had conversations with God. They even had regular visits. If you go to check on a friend, if you say I'm driving to Fonny to go see Pastor Milton, that is how God, like, let me go check on Adam. So total opposite, Genesis chapter 2, 1, and then backwards, all of creation. And then what we see after Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man is shame. Pain came into the world. Terror came into the world. And we are separated from God. We say man died a spiritual death. But remember, sin is what? It's punishable. Sin must be punishable. As God passed down the judgments, one of those judgments was passed to Satan. And it says personally, Satan will be destroyed by the descendants of the woman. Now let's read that one very, very well. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between you and her seed. He so that's where the confusion normally comes from. People who say this he, the first part of uh, 15 says, I will put an enmity between you and a woman and between your seed and her seed, which is many descendants, offsprings. The other verse says between your offsprings and her offsprings. But then the second part begins, says, he will, he shall bruise your head, which is single. One of these seeds will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Other versions give it clear. You shall hurt him a little bit, but he shall destroy you. I think by saying there's going to be an enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman, there's going to be conflict from this day forward going on until the seed of the woman crushes your head. And that event, ladies and gentlemen, is a process. It has not been completed yet. Since that day, They finally, when the seed of the woman does what? Crushes that. Now, we know the events that have happened. Jesus defeating uh, the 
Moses not giving in to temptation in the wilderness. That was crushing. But we are waiting for the day when that serpent, Satan, will be finally what? The end. This word conflict between good and evil, between you and me, fighting the sickness and diseases and the things we are going in is still. So the story from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, you can't divide them. You can't divide anything out of the Bible. From right there in the next chapter, guess what happens? Someone kills his brother, right? Cain kills his brother. After that, you and me right now, how many of you are fighting for land back home with your, with your siblings and brothers or fighting for anything? Anybody? I'm alone? <laughs> okay, you don't put up your hand. So from Genesis 3.15 to today, we are facing the same problem. And it is still going on. It's not over yet. So when David is fighting Goliath, it's not an isolated story. When Moses is going to face Pharaoh, that's not a story on its own. Everything began here. From this day forward, there's going to be an enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. There's going to be conflict from this day until one day his seed is going to crush your what? Your head. Every story you read from Genesis chapter 3 going on is one simple message. Conflict between good and evil. Amen? Until today, we still fall sick. We still go through problems. The same, same, same. <laughs> it is so funny. <laughs> the way I said it. Right after that, Cain went and killed what? Cain went and killed his, 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 his brother. Amen? And today, brothers and sisters still go through the same fights. Amen? Every day you hear conflict between a brother and a brother, a sister and a sister. Amen? Christians throughout the ages have understood that the promise of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is actually looking forward to the coming of Christ. The promise of the Messiah. And therefore, the first promise of the gospel is the promise that Christ will come to deliver us from the power of darkness. The first promise of the good news as you enter December, as you enter Christmas on the 25th and eat meat. <laughs> I grew up a Muslim. I used to be a Muslim. I was young. But Christmas was a day for eating. I didn't know what was going on. But we knew Christmas is a day we are going to eat. And you can eat at about five different homes. You eat at this house. You know all the homes are in the, very close to each other. As you prepare yourself to do the same, these days you'll eat at your own house. You don't, go, you don't go around eating. I want you to remember the promise of the gospel. We celebrate the good news. Started way back in Genesis chapter 3.15. That Christ will come and deliver us from the power of darkness. The book of Revelation still tells us, gives us pictures of what is coming. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. That great dragon was cast out. The serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. He will be cast to the earth. It's still going on. It is still happening. The promise of the gospel and the good news starts in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. If you listen to so many sermons online or if you read a lot of books about this, you'll hear so many people say, this that's not true. I believe it's true because of that second part that says he shall bruise. Apart from saying there will be enmity between your seed. The rest of the Bible story tells of the plight of human beings dealing with the terrible consequences of sin resulting from this day of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And then our ways of trying to get back to Genesis chapter 1 and two. Almost everything else in scripture from the murder of Abel in Genesis chapter 4 to the spiritual wickedness of the church in Lord this year if you read Revelation chapter 3 all these problems are not isolated. These are concerns of human sin problem. In fact the Bible says that the very earth itself 
groans under the weight of the curse of that day. Have you read Romans chapter 8 verse 20? Even the earth itself cries up to today from the what happened in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Romans chapter 8 verse 20. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Paul says until today. Paul is speaking this after Jesus has defeated the, 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 the enemy on the cross. But he says, until today the earth is still growing. Not only that, but we also, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves are still what? In pain. Let's read that one together. Romans chapter 8 verse 20. If you put it up, we'll get it very well. For we know the creation, I don't know what version you're reading, was subjected Yes, keep that one. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Go to the next one. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious. Can you read the uh, New King James Version if you have one? I'll read the New King James Version for you. For we know that the whole creation suffers groans in pains, labor pains, like a woman giving birth until this day now. Verse 23, if you pull up, go to verse 23. Not only the earth, keep going, keep going. Verse 23. Not only that, but we also who are the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within us, even we up to now, after believing, accepting Christ Jesus, we still go through pain. Amen? We still go through suffering, eagerly awaiting. We are still waiting, even up to today. From that day on, the earth, us and everybody, we're still waiting for the redemption of this body. By the end of the Old Testament, it was clear there's nothing we can do to get back to Genesis chapter 2. Cindy, no amount of obedience, no amount of religious practices could help us get back. No amount of personal sacrifice, nothing had even come close to dealing with the corruption of the human heart. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? We tried for the whole Old Testament. Nothing could ever work. God was willing to forgive, but sin must be punished. Because of sin, the promise of a rescue And so the promises start there. The promise of the good news comes from that background. The promise of the Messiah comes from that background. Shall not depart from Judah. Nor the law give. The law comes. So the way the prophecies and the promises. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. If you read in Genesis. The promise starts using going to come. One day, a prophet, something is going to happen. One day, they begin in Genesis. They begin now. One day, someone is going to come. One day, someone is going to come and change what is going on. Numbers says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but it's not near. I hear him, the star of Jacob is coming. You know, when we get to the prophet Isaiah, he says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. These prophecies, these people have not seen yet what we have seen. Isaiah chapter 7, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice, O greatly daughter of Zion. Shout you, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. These promises are all coming from the pain that we've gone through. God speaks, but these prophets start believing and dreaming. One day, one day, behold, daughter of Zion. Hang on, child of God. Your king is coming to you. He's coming with salvation. He'll be riding on the donkey. The last promise we have is in the book of Malachi, in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. It's a very, very long one. I'll try to summarize it. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I'll probably go up to verse 7. 
If you have it, you put it up. That's the last one we have of the prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 7. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? They thought it's going to be a day of his coming. They thought he's going to come with the bang. They thought it's going to be, you know, no one exactly knew how the birth of Jesus would happen. Verse 2, who can endure the day of the Lord? Who can stand when it appears? For it's going to be like a refining fire. You know, it's going to be like a launderer's soap. He will sit at a refiner. These are words of the prophet trying to describe what is going to happen when he finally comes. Verse 4, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord when he finally comes. So the prophecies, may, the words may not exactly be what, what happened on that day, but they are trying to describe this day of the Lord. Now, finally, in Malachi chapter 4 verse 4, we see this word. And the way Malachi says it, it's different. He says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Go to Malachi chapter 4 verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for Israel with the status of the judgment. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. They were waiting for Elijah. Why are they waiting for Elijah? Yet Elijah had already come before. So they are thinking, this day is coming when someone like Elijah is going to come. They don't know how to describe him, but they say he's going to be like Elijah. And Elijah is going to show up again. From that day on until the birth of Jesus, we don't see any new prophecies. We don't see God speaking. And most of you have heard that the Bible goes silent for four years hundred years. Amen? They go to exile in Babylon. When they maybe 200 BC, Alexander takes over, so the Greeks come in. The Greeks rule them. Uh, before Jesus is born, I think six to seven years, the Romans come in. Them take them to exile, then they send someone to rule on their behalf. what happened in Jerusalem and what happened in Judea. You know, Judea, the Greeks will come in and conquer. The then when the Romans come in, they say, no, Herod is going to be the king. Fulfilled these promises. Fulfilled any of the promises. None of them was born of a virgin birth. None of them When is this person coming? Leader. Yes, but he's not from the leader. But it's not from the line of David. The Romans have now come. They've given the line of David. King Herod. We are waiting. And very soon we are waiting. Something is the time of Jesus' birth, even before he was born, on the streets, it was very common to walk and find someone saying, the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Next Sunday or the other one, we'll understand why did, where did the wise men hear the word? We've come to see the prophet who has been born, the king of the Jews. Where did, learn, where did they learn that? News and information was spreading around. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. So there was this eager awaiting of the Messiah. For them, they were waiting for an Elijah. Many of them tried to do so many things. There was temple sacrifice. There was the people who became legalistic. You know, the Pharisees and the scribes tried to obey the law even more than what the law demands because, you know, he's coming. There was another group. They called them uh, 
Pastor Sek, they went and lived in the desert. Then you want to mix with the Romans. They say for us we'll go and live a holy life in the desert. There was so much going on before Jesus was born. Everyone is saying, you know, he's about to come. We are preparing ourselves. He's about to come because the promises are about to be fulfilled. So the Babylonians have come and gone. The Greeks have come and gone. Now the Romans are there. And through these different kingdoms, Judah, Israel, went through different leaders, but most of them are waiting. Where is the appointed one of the, where is the one appointed, the one promised, when is he coming? So the prophecies were going around about the coming Messiah. And bang, after 400 years, the New Testament opens with a bang. The first gospel, Mark says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. But before that, the one in Luke is a good one. In Luke chapter 1 verse 5. Let's begin with that one. Luke chapter 1 verse 5. If you go there really quick. Luke chapter 1 verse 5. There was in the day of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughter of Aaron, and his name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is the first appearance of the pronunciation of the good news. The angel appears to him standing on the right side of the altar. The silence of the 400 years. Shh. We are waiting. Waiting. Genesis Chapter 3, verse 15. And God says, bam. It's time now. The promise, the good news. The first angel appeared before who? Zechariah. Was it promised? Yes, it was promised. Since we go to sleep? No. Did time elapse? Yes. Did so many things happen? Finally, amen, the angel comes and says to Zechariah, side of the altar, verse 12, and when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call him his name John. So the first pronunciation appears here. The good news has finally come to start. But it was promised way back. And you will have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. Verse 15. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him. Verse 15, in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John the Baptist is going to show up and then he will prepare a way finally for the master to come. The promise of the good news is a reminder to us as Christians that we live in this Christian life of even Jesus himself tells us the promise that a good news is coming that God world constantly filled with warfare but the That when Christ died on the cross, having overcome Satan in the temptation in the wilderness, 
he gained full victory of him they will be finally realized and therefore you and me as we died went to heaven we are waiting for one final act what is that his so we've lived through most of the events of the promise one more is left you and i are living very close to that one more so paul said knowing the suffering the pain is not stopping finally my brothers be strong in the lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places that's Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 to 20 therefore take up the whole armor of god that you may be able to withstand in the evil day genesis 3:16 till today that evil day is still going on stand therefore guard your waist with the belt of truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness having showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel above all take the shield of faith which you'll be able to quench all the arrows of the enemy above all take on the shield verse 17 and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance so we live waiting that finally we've seen all these promises come he was born pronounced the next few sundays will be seeing the events of how he was born how the news was shared but we are still waiting he says praying always verse 18 with all prayers and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me too he says remember to pray for me so christ was born in bethlehem with all the anticipation that was around him with all the news with all the promises all the prophecies you think when he was born to celebrate that day guess what happened excited with all these promises and all this good news and all these wonderful stories when he showed up guess what happened a few wise men who traveled from far the east the whole town, the whole city, the whole Judea, the whole, even King Herod, the prophets, the Pharisees, everybody who was reading the prophecies, nobody got excited. Amen? He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him why do we get excited about christmas i don't know about your village but in my place december the first and second week the cities are empty people go back to that is it the same in your place yeah now you guys you travel in nice cars for us we travel on big lorries so you see people on top of the big cars <laughs> packed on each other and say back home back home back home <laughs> back home and the way those guys drive those buses and they're very crazy christmas and there's so many accidents around that time they be but it's going back home we're excited people were excited but listen his own did not receive him isn't it sad there should be so much excitement so much this be so so much you should have seen the angels we didn't see we read but the angels were singing ah, how many of you have heard angels sing for anything that day the angels were singing 
Also, it was a big day. But they did not receive him. And you know what happened? These guys even killed him. Whatever we've read from Genesis 3, man, is building a wonderful story to end in a wonderful day. The king is born today. Not to these guys. And not only to them, even to us today. We're still waiting to celebrate the whole month. We're still waiting to put on Christmas carols and candlelight services. But some of us have still not accepted him as we were waiting for the big news. We celebrate the day. We celebrate the season. We put up Christmas trees. But this man here, up to today, some of us have not carried the excitement of the shepherds, the excitement of the wise men, the excitement of the angels. These guys looked around and said, you know what? Let us put him on the cross. Because this man, I don't know. I don't know what they, I don't know what they were, I don't know what happened. But remember, this enmity between you and your offspring is still going on. Whenever the promise is fulfilled, only two groups are drawn. Those who accept the good news and those who do not. Who missed the good news? The Pharisees, the scribes. King Herod missed it when they came and told him, do you know about the birth of the king of the Jews? He called all the, the, the scholars and the scribes and they asked them, have you read where is he going to be born? What did they tell him? He's to be born in Bethlehem. Therefore they knew, right? This boy knew. They knew everything. They all, they say, he's to be born in Bethlehem. And guess who continued on the way? The wise men from the east kept going. These guys stayed. They didn't say, let's go look for him. Later, Herod says, you know what? Go in that town, kill everybody who's two years in <laughs> Amen. The promise has been made. Which side? The Romans missed it also. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 3. Let's read that one as we finish. It was promised, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 3, and that promise gives us hope. If you put it up, we read it together. <clears throat> Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. It was promised, let's read this one, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. You can say to preach good news. He has finally come up. These are the words of the prophet Isaiah. He's speaking these words. Jesus will let us speak these words. To preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Verse 2. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Keep going. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. Verse 3. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called the trees of righteousness. The promise of the good news. Jesus came and read those words. He says, I have come and I have come to give this good news. It was promised and that promise gives us hope. Our hope is not a failing hope. Partially, we saw Jesus being born. We saw him being tempted. We saw him beaten. We saw him crucified. Things were all promised and they happened. We are waiting for one final act. The fulfillment of the whole promise. Comes back to close the chapter.
like the Romans? Will you be waiting? Be waiting like the uh, shepherds? Will you be waiting like the uh, wise men of the east? If any man hears me, what will I do? Opens the door, I will come in. I will dine with him and I will dwell with him. He who endures to the end the same shall be saved. We are not over yet. He says, do not get weary in doing good. For in due season, if you do not weary, guess what? Your reward is coming. The promise of the good news you can say is a sure deal. In Uganda, we shake your hand and say, Chiwede. That means the deal is complete. The promise of the good news is a sure deal. If you have not believed in him and the promise, here is the promise fulfilled that will celebrate his birth. We know he was born. That's why we are going to celebrate Christmas. Isn't you? There's no more doubt in the whole world that Jesus was born. No more doubt. That was a promise fulfilled. It's going to happen. We don't know the exact date he was born, but we celebrate it on December 25. Regardless of the day, we still celebrate that the first promise was fulfilled. He was born. The last one remaining, he is coming back. Sure deal? Yes. Why? Because all those promises happened. He came that day. People saw him, they lived with him, and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has appointed me. And so, my friend, the promise of the good news awaits. And the question always, always comes back to us, which side are we waiting on? Amen? Stand upon your feet as we pray today. The promise of the good news. As we go through these days, talking about Christmas, number one, we've remembered that the good news was promised. Amen? The good news was what? Was promised. And because it was promised, it happened. When did it start? Way, way back. And you and I are still on this journey today going. I don't know about you, but we're all looking forward to the day when he does what? He fulfills the last act. Bruce ahead the serpent. Defeat the great dragon in Revelation. That's Satan. You'll be defeated completely. You and I finally will say, alas, he lives. And then we'll live with him forever. Amen. It's coming. Why do I know? Because almost half of it has already happened. So it's a sure deal. So if you don't believe it and you're here today, this is the day of the Lord. Amen. And if you're watching us at home, this is the day. What does it take to say, you know what, Christ? I have heard the gospel. He says, the Christ, the Savior of the world is coming. So as we celebrate Christmas this week, I want you to keep remembering this. The promise of the good news. What is the good news? His plan to redeem us back to pre-Genesis chapter 3. And it's going to happen. Sure deal. So if you hear close eyes, and you want us to pray together and you say man lord i really really want to be part of that that is excited that you were born and that you came to this world and i want to receive you today in my heart father in heaven we want to thank you because you're good one day a group of people left you jesus and you asked those who remained said you want to go also and they said where shall we go for you have the words of life. And these words of life today that we share. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your word today says, Come to me, all you labor, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so as we come to you today, Lord, believing on this promise of the good news, as we celebrate this season of Christmas, Lord, may you come into our heart. And Lord, we say today, we receive you in our hearts. And there's someone here, Lord, who's touching their chest and saying, Lord, I need you in my heart. I need you in my life. I need you in my family. Apart from anything else we could ever need, 
you sent us Jesus because we needed forgiveness of sins. So Father, we thank you today because of Christ Jesus. And may we not be like Herod and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the, the scribes and the, the people. And may we not be. May we be excited about this news. May we receive you today in our hearts. May we go singing, blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we want to thank you today. We want to give you praise because you're good. We receive you, Jesus, in our hearts. Lord, touch someone here today. Anything we are going through, Lord, heal us. But Lord, as these battles continue going on, we still have a responsibility to accept you because sin will not go unpunished. So we thank you because you're good. Receive someone here today, Lord, who's calling your name. Someone who says, Lord, forgive my sins. Receive me in your kingdom. I want to be with you. Write my name in the book of life. And when you come back on that day, I want to be with those who will be taken up with you. Because the promise of God is yes and amen. So we thank you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Someone say amen. May the good Lord bless you. Do not forget why we're here. Amen. Christ Jesus, born for you and me. We'll see you again at 6 p.m. Actually, the doors open at 5.30. Amen. We're going to be a wonderful a wonderful concert here. And then there will be a game sharing of the good news. So bring someone who's never gone to church. Tell them there's a concert. Tell them about this African Children's Choir. And for those of you who are hosting them, thank you for much. They'll have a meeting with you early on. So go home quickly. Take a break. Drive back. If you live far away, do not go. Amen? Ah, but I don't have lunch for you. Praise the Lord. But there's child man does. Hallelujah. Shake your neighbor. Tell them, have you received him? Ask him, is he in your heart? Is he here with you? Receive Christ Jesus today. We'll see you at 6 p.m. May God bless you. Say hi to someone. Do not go alone home. Bring your kids. Bring everybody. For those of you watching us online, we will see you also here at 6 p.m. God bless you.